All right, so get ready, folks, because we are diving into a fascinating piece of training history today. Ooh, love a good blast from the past. Right. Taking us back in time, are we? We are. We've got this article from, get this, November 1984. It's called Using a Group Process to Create Models and Matrices. 1984, wow. Okay, so assuming leg warmers and shoulder pads weren't involved, what kind of training wisdom did they have back then? Right. Well, it was published in the Performance and Instruction Journal which was for pros trying to, you know, boost workplace performance. Okay, so still relevant then, trying to get people performing at their best. Exactly. And you know what's interesting? Even back in the early days of personal computers, these authors were wrestling with some seriously familiar questions. Like what? Give us the 80s version of training dilemmas. How do you really pinpoint what training is needed? And the big one, how do you make sure the training actually translates into better performance? Timeless challenges right there. Makes you realize some things never change, even if the tech does. Totally. And this article, despite its age, lays out a structured approach that's honestly still super relevant today. All right, so spill the beans. What did these training gurus from 1984 recommend? So they were big on using a group process. Okay, I'm intrigued. They believed in bringing people together to really define job functions, find those sneaky knowledge and skill gaps, right. and then use all that intel to build laser-focused training programs. So even back then, they knew training wasn't a one-size-fits-all kind of deal. Absolutely not. They were all about results. In fact, get this, they actually said, management will readily support training when the relationship between training and improved job performance is clear smart cookies, knew how to speak the language of results, even back then. For sure. So how did they suggest this whole group thing actually went down? Well, they start by stressing the importance of getting a good mix of people involved. We're talking supervisors, seasoned employees. Right, the old pros. Exactly. But here's the kicker. They also wanted to bring in brand new hires. Interesting. Why new hires? Their thinking was to get those fresh eyes on what it really takes to succeed in a specific role. Oh, that makes a ton of sense. They'd have a unique perspective on what information might be missing or what skills are super critical right out of the gate. No, precisely. They haven't been in the system long enough to develop any blind spots. Okay, so you've got this dream team assembled ready to revamp your training. What happens next? So they've got their A team of experts and new recruits all ready to brainstorm some training magic. What do they do with all those perspectives? Okay, so picture this. They've got everyone gathered around a table, probably with some coffee and those giant notepads from back in the day. Ooh, I love those. The ones with the grid paper. Yes, exactly. And they're not just diving into a free-for-all brainstorming session. They're actually using a structured approach. Interesting. What kind of structure are we talking about? Well, they were really into this thing called the nominal group technique. The what now? That sounds very uh, yeah. technical. Right. It sounds way more complicated than it actually is. It's really just a fancy way of making sure everyone's voice is heard. Oh, okay, so it's about making sure nobody's dominating the conversation yeah. and everyone feels comfortable sharing their ideas. You got it. It's all about preventing groupthink and getting those diverse perspectives out in the open. They wanted to make sure the new hire felt just as comfortable speaking up as, say, a senior manager. Love that. Everyone's insights are valuable. Precisely. So once they've gathered all this rich qualitative data through their structured group discussions, they turn to a visual tool to help organize everything. Oh, I love a good visual. What did they use? They use something called a knowledge slash skill matrix. Okay, a matrix. Mm -hmm. I'm intrigued. I'm already picturing Keanu Reeves dodging bullets in slow motion. Aha, uh -huh. not quite that exciting, but it is a pretty powerful tool. Imagine a simple grid. On one axis, you've got all the essential job functions, you know, the core things someone needs to be able to do in that role. Got it. So for a salesperson, it might be things like conducting product demos or negotiating contracts, that kind of thing. Exactly. And then on the other axis, you list out all the knowledge and skills someone would need to perform each of those functions effectively. So you can literally see the connection between the what and the how. That's really smart. It is. And the authors of this article were very big on the power of visuals. Oh, I bet. It would be so much easier to wrap your head around those connections with a matrix than just trying to keep track of everything in your head. Exactly. It's like creating a blueprint, a roadmap for building a really targeted training program. I love that analogy. And I bet it would be incredibly valuable for onboarding new hires, too. Mm -hmm. You could basically hand them a roadmap of what they need to learn to be successful in their new role. Precisely. 
And it brings a whole new level of transparency to the training process. Speaking of today, we're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, I want to dig into how this 1984 approach compares to how we design training programs in the 21st century. All right, so we've been on this journey through time with this 1984 training method. What really jumps out at you is different from how we design training today. You know, it's funny. They were so focused on visual collaboration even before we had all the fancy digital tools we have now. Imagine that, using flip charts and markers for those matrices. That's like the good old days, but yeah. they were onto something, right? <laughs> Getting everyone on the same page, literally. Exactly. And I think that's a good reminder. You know, even with all the technology we have now, we can't lose sight of that human element. Right. At the end of the day, it's about people learning. It's about people applying new skills. Yeah. So how do they connect training back to, well, actual job performance back then? Well, they might not have had fancy task analysis techniques, but they were thinking about it. Remember how they focused on outputs and measures? Oh, yeah. They were all about measuring results. Yeah. Did they give any specifics on, you know, actually measuring if the training worked? They did. There's this great example in the article where they talk about using this process to design training for service account engineers. Yeah. And get this, they even included a draft of their functional job model. So they were walking the walk. What did the model show? It breaks down all the key outputs and measures for that role. You can see how much emphasis they put on tying the training to actual outcomes. Makes you wonder how many training programs, even today, really nail that connection to the bottom line. Right. And think about it. That focus on showing the value of training, it's only gotten more crucial over time. We've got so much data and tools to track that impact now. It's like they were ahead of their time, you know? This 1984 article, it's a solid framework and we've just added more tools and layers to it over the years. 100%. The heart of it is still relevant, getting those stakeholders involved, using visuals, and proving that training makes a difference. Those are timeless. Absolutely. Big shout out to those pioneers, Ray Svensson, Karen Wallace, and Guy Wallace. They were already tackling these challenges back in 84. Absolutely. Paving the way for us. And on that note, I think it's time to wrap up this little trip down memory lane. But before we go, I want to leave everyone with something to think about. We've seen how a model from almost 40 years ago can still teach us something today. So think about your own work. What can you borrow from the classics? How can you blend those ideas with the latest and greatest tools you have? It's a really exciting time to be in the world of learning and development. Thanks for joining us for another deep dive. <music>